I'm not really a big fan of Jean-Luc Godard anymore. I think, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, I just think I've outgrown him. Godard was so influential to me at the beginning of, of my aesthetic as a director, of like wanting to be a director. His kind of like lack of complete any type of film style, just, just wanting to make movies for love of it. Godard is the one who taught me the fun and the freedom and the joy of, of breaking rules, just fucking around with the entire medium. <laughs> Like many other things in our modern world, the course of film history was changed forever by the Second World War. Now, despite having grown out of him, Quentin Tarantino's self-conscious postmodern aesthetic is a direct descendant of the self-conscious postmodern work of Jean-Luc Godard, and the French New Wave, of which Godard is a pioneer, emerges and is a response to the circumstances arising out of the end of World War II. Let me explain. A year after the end of the war, after the liberation of France from Nazi control, French Prime Minister Leon Blum traveled to Washington, D.C. to meet with Secretary of State James Burns to negotiate an agreement that would cancel France's $2 billion war debt. The result of the Blum-Burns agreement was the almost complete opening of French markets to American cultural products, particularly films. Before this agreement, France had imposed quotas on the number of American films allowed to play in French theaters as a way to preserve the unique identity of French cinema. The Bloomburns Agreement decimated those quotas, resulting in the free market domination of American Hollywood movies in France. Into this universe, the founding members of the French New Wave grew up. In the pages of Cahiers du Cinema, they advanced a new form of film theory criticizing many of their French forefathers and praising the work of Hollywood studio directors like Alfred Hitchcock, Orson Welles, and John Ford. Why don't you finish the job? Awash in hundreds of Hollywood B-movies and in-depth analysis of American auteurs, Jean-Luc Godard makes Breathless, from a story treatment by New Wave compatriots Francois Truffaut and Claude Chabrol. Breathless is an extended investigation of a French filmic identity in the shadow of Hollywood dominance, of indeed whether an identity informed by another nation's culture can exist at all. Breathless tells the story of small-time crook Michel in the aftermath of his murder of a police officer on his way to see his American lover, Patricia, in Paris. Michel models his personality on Humphrey Bogart, just as the film models itself on a Hollywood crime thriller. But in both cases, these identifications are continually frustrated. For example, take a look at the film's inciting incident. The film opens with Michel dressed like a parody of an American gangster, mimicking a gesture attributed to Bogart. He then steals an American Oldsmobile from an American military officer, which almost immediately furnishes him with an implement to make his identity complete, a revolver. After running a light, Michel is chased by two motorcycle cops. One eventually tracks him down, and a shootout ensues, the classic dramatic moment of the film noir. But look at the sequence of shots in which this shootout unfolds. Ne bouge pas, je te brûle. The whole scene plays like a misfire of these kinds of moments. Not only does a murder seem totally unmotivated for the crime committed, but we don't even get to see the cop's face. The shootout takes place over only five shots in 10 seconds, with imagery and sound effects out of sync, and the camera impulsively favors extreme close-ups that obscure the action, instead of wide shots that would have made everything clear. Everything in the sequence serves to rob Michel of his part in the confrontation. The film itself intervenes to strip the scene down to bare, formulaic elements. In this way, the film is always watching over Michel, making comments on his immature desire to become Bogart or actually interjecting itself to upset that desire. Later, Michel confronts a poster of his hero, a giant image of Bogart from his very last movie, The Harder They Fall. You can see Michel's pale reflection being dwarfed by his hero. And then you have a face-off between the two men, both totally stone-faced and unreadable. Seconds later, the film loudly announces itself by ending the scene with a wacky, awkward, outmoded iris transition. What's being called to attention here? 
Well, I think the late film critic Dennis Turner gives us a hint when he cites the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. See, Lacan's most famous contribution to our understanding of human development is something called the mirror stage. It describes the moment when a baby first sees itself in the mirror. Who's that little girl? Is that you? Too young to have any control yet over itself, the infant recognizes a unity in its mirror version and aspires to that unity, projecting itself into the place of the other. This means that the very formation of ourselves, the first time we perceive ourselves as a subject, what we perceive is not really us, it's an imaginary projection of us. For this reason, the human subject, says Lacan, is always divided. It's never really whole. Michel is someone consumed by his identification. Looking at Bogart, he doesn't recognize the impossibility of becoming his hero. He just stares intently forward, and it's left to the film and its anachronistic fade-out to inform us that it knows better. Michel's immaturity is matched by his love interests. Patricia. That long, famous scene that sits at the heart of this movie, with Michelle holed up in Patricia's bedroom, is preceded by a long look in the mirror by Patricia, and it features mirrors all the way through and images of lovers and other men and women. Both characters are lost, in search of a solid identity that might be reflected in the other. Their back and forth is a constant oblique probing into the other, hoping to mine some reaction, some statement that might explain finally who they are. At the end of the film, Michel finally gets everything he needs to escape. But after Patricia betrays him to the police, his imaginary identification with Bogart is finally broken. The tragedy is that the film still forces him along the tracks of the genre inside which he's trapped. The cops bumbling like silly parodies of themselves all throughout the film still, nonetheless, gun him down. Breathless, like its hero, oscillates between these two registers. It wants to participate in the Hollywood filmmaking it admires, but it knows that such an identification is impossible. So it deals with this by being self-conscious, by using jump cuts, awkward transitions, by robbing the classic moments of their force, or making the hero's bloody final steps way longer than it could ever possibly be, forcing you outside of the film's text, or back into it again, depending on how you look at it. It's no surprise that the effects of war are vast and unexpected. America flooded France with its films, onto which the new wave filmmakers projected a superiority that they created by then identifying with it in their movies. In other words, American economic dominance created an ideological dominance in the minds of the dominated. For Godard, the only way to deal with this was to be conscious of the dynamic unfixed nature of these identities. Indeed, it's the only way that we can deal with the dynamic, unfixed nature of our own identities. The unexpected thing is how influential that consciousness was when it eventually came back across the Atlantic. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. The first set of Nerdwriter stickers have been sent out in the mail, so if you got some of those on Patreon, check for that. Also, there are a lot more stickers than I thought, so I'm gonna put up 60 more sets of those stickers on my Patreon page, which you can claim by clicking right here, pledging $3 per video, and you get two stickers. If you've already got the reward, I'd ask you to keep pledging just because, you know, that's what makes this channel possible, my Patreon. Um, you know, these videos take like 50 hours to make, so it is a full-time job you know, legitimately. And uh, I hope you guys see that reflected in the quality of the content. Um, so thank you guys so much again, and I will see you all next Wednesday.